As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 231. Lego. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he teaches business to his kids during bath time, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com SPI for 5% off your order. 
That's uplifttdesk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. This is a very, very important episode because it has to do with legal things related to your business. And I know a lot of this is very scary and a lot of it is very overwhelming. And I know because I've spoken to a lot of people who, because of the legal things that are required or that are out there related to business, they don't get started at all. And that's not good because we all have a lot to contribute to this world. We can reward ourselves and others through the businesses that we create. And uh, we shouldn't let things like legal things stop us sometimes. Now, of course, we have to play by the rules, which is why I'm very excited because I invited two people on who have helped me with legal things. And of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I just wanna get that out of the way, but these two people are. Richard Chapo from SoCalInternetLawyer.com and then also Elena Heronin from HeroninLaw.com and all the links and resources mentioned in this episode, including links to their websites, will be available at SmartPassiveIncome.com slash session 231, which you can check out at the end of the show. But I actually polled the audience. I sent an email out and asked a lot of you, well, what legal things do you have questions about so that we can answer as many of them as possible? We didn't get to all of them, and there were a lot of people that actually asked a lot of the same questions. So my plan was to initially feature some of your voicemails because some of you did leave voicemail questions uh, about these things and mention your names and stuff, but so many people asked about the same things. We're gonna touch on a lot of those things. So I just wanna credit everybody out there who had asked questions, and I was told after the show that Richard and Elena were more than happy to come on uh, on guest posts later on answering specific questions that you might have. So if we don't get to questions that you have about legal things today, you can leave questions at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 231 or also at askpat.com and we'll compile those and I'll have them answer those and put them into a roundup blog post of some kind that comes out every few months because this is really important stuff. I've gotten into legal trouble in the past myself uh, with trademark issues specifically, uh, but there's a lot of other things out there that can happen. But again, I don't want the legal stuff to stop you and make you feel overwhelmed. And that's why I invited Richard and Elena here on the show today. And so we're gonna get right into it and you'll hear me discuss what these questions are and I have them answer one by one. And some of this stuff may or may not be relevant to you. And I, I encourage you to, as some for some of you, this might be boring because it's legal and it's stuff that really uh, isn't as exciting as you know building products and advertising and, and building relationships with your audience. But of, of course, like I said, it's really important. So listen all the way through because at the end they have some really great advice for those of you who may be feeling overwhelmed with all this stuff. Uh, but I felt it was really important to compile this information and uh, here are my US-based, actually California-based lawyers that have helped me out in certain situations and they're gonna talk about their roles right here at the very beginning. So let's uh, let's get right into it. I've been practicing since 1992 as well. So um, I practice in the areas of um, for-profit and non-profit businesses, and I do contracts, trademarks, and copyrights. And, um, well, I guess that's about it. I I, uh, I don't know what else you'd want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get into a lot of the stuff that um, the audience has actually asked about. And, you know, I've had a lot of questions in the past about legal stuff that I was always a little bit afraid to talk about because I just know that I'm not really qualified to talk about all this stuff and there's sort of legal ramifications that can happen when I share things like that. So that's why I wanted to bring the experts on. So Richard and Elena, thank you again for coming on. And first, let's start with you, Richard. For those just starting out, you know, legal can be something that can be very scary often. It stops people from getting started because there just is a lot to think about. So what are some good basic sort of getting started things that entrepreneurs should um, just at least focus on, worry about, in order to get started uh, in the proper way? Uh, sure. I think if you're starting out, you know, obviously, um, you know, the legal issues can be complex. And the other factor, quite frankly, is, you know, the cost. Um, in a perfect world, you know, you'd really want to form a business entity, typically an LLC, uh, that's going to create, you know, a hurdle um, should somebody come after you for a liability perspective. Uh, and in addition, by liability insurance, uh, which is something we can discuss in greater detail later. Um, those are really two foundational steps that you want to take. Um, when you have a website and an app, you know, the biggest things that you want are terms and conditions and a privacy policy. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there are free sets out there uh, floating around on the web. There's also generators. And they're really horrible. Um, 
you know, I, I would try to budget in the cost of doing terms and conditions and privacy policies started as part of your startup. Um, the problem is that if you get them wrong, you can really run into serious problems. Um, so, for example, with privacy policies, um, most privacy policies that you'll find for free online will have, contain a statement that says, we do not share rent or sell your personal information to third parties. Sounds like a noble idea. Um, unfortunately, it absolutely kills your business. And, you know, one case can really tell us why. This case involved a dating site called True.com. Uh, it was a large dating site. It was doing very well. Unfortunately, its parent company had all kinds of problems, and the parent company went bankrupt. And so True.com was dragged into the bankruptcy uh, estate. Another dating site called Plenty of Fish tried to buy True.com. They offered $700,000 for the membership uh, list and for the site. And uh, the Attorney General of a variety of states objected to the sale, and the reason was the privacy policy had that statement that we will not sell, share, or rent your personal information. Well, the sale of uh, the sale of a website is the sale of personal information. Um, so when you have those kinds of clauses in your privacy policies, you know you're really killing your exit strategy from your business. Um, with terms and conditions, you know I think at this point everybody knows who Zappos is, very large retailer sold for. A huge amount of money to Amazon.com. Uh, a few years back, uh, they had a data issue where they were hacked, basically, and the customer information was collected. And the terms and conditions contained a clause saying, we reserve the right to update these terms and conditions whenever we want, and if you continue to use the site, you agree to the, this update. And as Lena and any other lawyer would tell you, the problem with that is it's an unconscionable clause. It's just it's completely one-sided doesn't require any notice or acceptance by the user of the site, and so it's an invalid contract, and that's what the court ruled. And so the terms and conditions for Zappos were thrown out. Those terms and conditions would have saved them a significant amount of money. They probably would have settled the dispute for $100,000, which sounds like a lot, um, but for a company of that size, it's nothing. Instead, they're facing upwards of, oh, I don't know, 30 or $40 million in settlements. Um, so spending money on those two documents it's something you really want to do, um, if possible. So terms and Another conditions area, and privacy policy were those two yeah. were those two things. Okay. Right. They're legalese. Uh, if you think of your health insurance or your car insurance, um, you know, I'm an attorney. I buy car insurance. I never read the contract. And that contract is written as in favor of the insurance company as possible. And that's really the way your terms and your privacy policy should, uh, privacy policy should be written as well. They're there to protect you. And everybody, you know, most business owners look at them as an annoyance, but they're ammunition in your belt. They help you. Um, so plan on spending money there. Another area where we see big problems with, that should be part of any, any website is if you allow visitors to your site to upload anything, images, music, text, uh, comply with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, better known as the DMCA. It's controversial a lot, but for website owners and app owners, it is a beautiful law because it does this. If you comply with it, you cannot be found liable for copyright infringement based on content uploaded by your users. So if you think about Facebook, uh, somebody uploads a cartoon or a video or a song or anything of that sort that is copyrighted, Facebook cannot be found liable um, for that copyright infringement. Only the user can. So it really protects you, and complying with the DMCA costs a couple hundred bucks. It's definitely something that anybody starting out wants to do. And in these day, this day and age, you know, most sites are going to have uh, some kind of interactivity. So do it, please do it. <laughs> so how, how, would one, how would one comply with the DMCA? What does that mean exactly? Well, you can you can contact an attorney um, to go through it, or frankly, there's a book on Amazon for sale called the DMCA Handbook, uh, and most people can read that. Uh, it's written by an attorney in Arizona, and she went through and detailed the whole process. It, it makes sense to me as an attorney. If it's a bit confusing to you, you can consult with any attorney. It would take less than an hour. Uh, frankly, the biggest expense is really designating an agent. You have to register uh, and designate an agent with the Copyright Office, United States Copyright Office. It costs $140. They have one clerk that handles all the designations um, for filings from around the world. So it's a little annoying. Um, but it's it's a fairly simple process. Basically, if a complaint comes in, you have to take down uh, the content in question. Then the person who posted the content has the right to counter notice, basically saying, you know, no, it's not infringement. And at that point, you alert the person who made the original complaint. And those two parties go have at it in court. But you are not dragged into court. Uh, this is how Twitter, Facebook, all of the Instagram, all of these sites and services avoid, you know, being pushed into bankruptcy by millions of copyright infringement lawsuits. Okay. 
Yeah, the D- DMCA that sounds familiar to me because I've I know that that's something that you have to deal with if you see some of your own content that you've written or maybe one of your own books or an image that you created yourself on somebody else's site. Before Elena, before we get to you, um, Richard, could you speak on that a little bit? If you see some of your own content on somebody else's site, I know DMCA has something to do with that. What what steps should you take to hopefully get that taken down? Right. So typically, uh, if you put it up on the web, it's going to be stolen at some point, whether it's scraped by a bot or some other source, uh, and you will find them in other places. And typically at that point, uh, the DMCA, is, what the DMCA's purpose was essentially to avoid um, flooding the courts across the U.S. with endless copyright infringement lawsuits. So it creates an informal process for getting content taken down. So the way to do it is use something called a DMCA takedown notice. Um, and what you would do is, let's say that I'm, I run a copyscape search and I find uh, somebody's copied one of my blog posts to another blog. I would contact that blog probably informally first and just say, you know, what's going on? Take this down. If I don't get any response, which typically I wouldn't, I would then identify who the host is and you would do that by going to the who is record mm-hmm. and look up their host and then you would go to the host's website and they'll have a copyright or abuse or DMCA link somewhere in the bottom of the site. And then you click that, and then you would submit the form, and there are various elements that you have to you have to declare. So you would have to pl- uh, provide the domain for the original content on your blog, the domain for uh, the blog that's stealing your content, and then a statement under penalty of perjury, basically that you know you created the work and that you own it. And at that point, the host will take down uh, the content in question. It's not a situation where they review it and think about it or try to evaluate whether it's infringement. They automatically take it down. And in 99% of cases, um, that's the end of it. Yep. Uh, the other side can you know, file a counter notice, but if they just copied your, your content, they're never going to. Right. I've run across that on YouTube before. Somebody swiped my YouTube video and uploaded it onto their own channel. And YouTube has a really good um, method of reporting that, and they're typically pretty fast at taking those things down. So, yeah, that, that's good. That's actually going to be really helpful for a lot of people because I know that's one of the biggest complaints that people have is you know, all this hard work. One of the other things I would just mention, so business model, black hat business model, black hat is doing things that are unethically or violate the regulations uh, for various sites. One black hat strategy is you send bots out to copy uh, content off of various sites and then you publish them on a new site and that site is hosted offshore. Well, the DMC is only a law in the United States. Um, so if you start trying to serve notices on somebody in Amsterdam or someplace of that sort, you know, they're often going to ignore it. In that situation, what you want to do is go to Google, um, being in Yahoo, uh, and anywhere where there, you can see you know, traffic being sourced. It's typically going to be the search engines. And you can follow DMCA takedown notices with them as well, and they will delist the site. Mm. And in that situation, obviously, you get rid of most of the traffic. You also get rid of duplicate content penalties, things of that sort. Yeah. If affiliate uh, programs are being promoted um, with your content, you can contact those programs as well, and they'll often uh, terminate the person. Great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Elena, let's move on to you. Let's talk a little bit about business structure. You know, Richard mentioned a little bit about, you know, LLC versus S Corp and all that stuff. Like, can you help us define which one is best for who? And even even going further, you know, I know there are some companies, um, including my own, that have sort of an umbrella company and then use either uh, DBAs or doing business as or other, other elements to kind of have different businesses under one umbrella business. Can you speak a little bit about you know, where does one start even with how to determine what business structure is right? We know that we should create a business for protection, and so it's separate from ourselves, of course, but where do you even start with that, Elena? Well, um, the simplest and cheapest possible um, business structure would be the sole proprietorship, of course, where you basically just get a business license um, and you can start operating, and that that's nice because it is cheap and it's easy. Mm-hmm. Um but it doesn't give you the liability protection at all. So uh, likewise with a partnership. Uh, a partnership is worse than a sole proprietorship because then you're liable not only for, you know, the errors that you make, but also for those of your partner. Um, to get the liability protection, you want to set up a formal uh, corporation or LLC, which gives you limited liability. Um, and... Uh, basically, they're pretty similar, except that um, corporation. Well, corporations are 
owned by shareholders, just for terminology purposes, uh, corporations are owned by shareholders, Mm -hmm. and they're managed by officers, and then they have a board of directors who control the officers. And then LLCs are owned by members, which is basically the equivalent of shareholders, and um, they're managed by either the members or by managers. So um, just the organizational structure is a little bit different. Um, Liability-wise, they both give you limited liability. Tax-wise, they're the corporation. If you don't make the S election, you will be subject to double tax. Uh, that means that you know the corporation pays tax on its profit, and then when it distributes dividends to its shareholders, the shareholders pay tax on the dividends. So that's that's called the double tax. Mm-hmm. Um, if you make the S election, then um, you can be treated for tax purposes as a pass-through entity, which means you don't pay the tax at the corporate level. You're just paying tax at the um, shareholder level. Um, you do, with all three, the corporation, S corporation, and LLC, you do have to pay an $800 minimum franchise tax, um, but you can avoid a lot of the other, avoid some of the other taxes. Uh, so one of the things that you can do, so with a corporation, um, some people find it helpful tax-wise to pay themselves sort of a slightly lower than normal salary and not have to pay employment taxes on the rest of the profit of the corporation. So you can do that with an S corporation because, um, like I said, the S corporation has passed through tax treatment. So anything that you pay yourself as a salary, you are subject to self-employment taxes, but whatever you pay yourself as a dividend is not. Now, this isn't um, something that should be abused, of course, because the IRS does look to see if you're paying yourself a reasonable wage, and they can go back and um, deem some of your dividends as wages and charge you back taxes and penalties. So you do have to be careful, but some people have found that to be um, a, a way to save on employment taxes as well. So would you recommend, even before selecting sort of a business structure to connect with a a financial person to kind of help walk you through which one might be the best for you, depending on what kind of business you have? You should always have a conversation with your accountant. That's for sure. Um, And, but it's not really a a terribly complicated decision. Um, And so if you call an attorney, they're going to be able to suggest to you um, what, which, which form of the entity might work best for you, whether it's a corporation or S corporation or, or an LLC. Now, let's say you have a business, an LLC that you've created, and then under that LLC, you have sort of another idea for something that could be, um, you know, another sort of kind of business, I guess you could say, or a sub-business, if you will. Um, Would you, what would you recommend in terms of dealing with that? Would you recommend creating a whole completely different entity for that second thing? Because, you know, us entrepreneurs, we have a ton of different ideas. I think a lot of people know this from watching what I do and all the different projects that I have a hand in. So would you recommend having an umbrella company to manage all that or separate companies or does it kind of depend? It depends for sure. Um, Again, if you wanted to go the most economical route, what you could do is just have one LLC and then own several DBAs or fictitious business names as they're called. Um, And then you can, you know, set up separate accounting for each of those different DBAs on your own record so that you can track, you know, which one is making profit and which one's not. Um, But they really are just part of the same LLC. Now, the disadvantage with that is that each business unit is a risk and also um, suffers exposure from the other business units. So if one of your business units um, has, you know, potential for higher uh, liability, then, you know, you might want to protect the other ones from that one. The way you can do that is um, set up separate uh, LLCs for each one because then they're protected from each other. So um, when I'm saying limited liability, that means that if the entity were sued, the assets that would be um, subject to that lawsuit would be only the assets of the LLC and not those of the owners or the other, um, you know, sister companies. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely... uh, reduce your liability to each of the business units by setting up separate entities. Now, you do have to take into consideration the cost right. because there is a cost with setting up the entity and maintaining it. Um, you have to have you know, separate tax returns. You pay your $800 minimum franchise tax if, even if you're not making a profit for each of those. Um, and you, 
know, of course, you have a, a little bit of legal expenses as well with each of the entities on an annual basis. Now, the $800 franchise tax you were talking about, that's... If I could just jump in, that $800 oh, expense is really only California. That's California, yeah, sorry, yes. Okay, it, which actually brings up a great question. So, Richard or Elaine, I don't know who wants to speak to this, it just came up... A lot of people, when they're starting businesses, they hear that, oh, Delaware is where you should start a business because they are more favorable toward businesses and there's no taxes or, you know, Oregon or Washington, not California, even though you might live in California. How do you determine where you should be starting a business or is is that strategy of setting up an LLC in a different state even worthwhile considering? Uh, maybe, Richard, you could speak to that. Uh I don't know if Leo and I would have the same opinion about this. I, I'm not in favor I'd of it, typically. To, I'd, I'd be happy to um, comment on that oh, if, you, if you would like. Um, yeah, because I get, I get that question a lot. Um, people want to set up a Nevada corporation because there's no corporate or income taxes in Nevada. But the, the problem is when you are located in California, you're subject to all the California laws anyway. So um, if you are you're living here, you're working here, you're maybe you have employees here, and you don't, live or work or have employees or office in Nevada, then um, it doesn't work. It doesn't really work for you. So what happens is um, if you're a foreign corporation, say you're uh, incorporated in Nevada, you have to qualify. It's called qualifying in California. And it's basically the same steps as you would have to take if you were to incorporate in California. And you're subject to all the same filings, all the same disclosures, you know, and basically what happens is you're just duplicating your expenses because not only have you paid to set up your entity in Nevada, but now you're also having to pay for all the standard California fees. And none of the fees are less either just because you're a foreign corporation. So see. that part doesn't really help you. Now, the way it can help you is if you actually move to Nevada and set up your business there and work there and have your employees there. Ah, which I don't think I'll ever do. <laughs> I have several um, clients that have done that. They were California entities. They moved to Nevada. They're happily working there, and um, you know they're not paying their corporate or income taxes because there aren't any, <laughs> but um, they're no longer California residents. Yeah, but all the savings are burned up by running the air conditioner 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would just throw in a couple things on that. Um, uh, you know, one of the things about Delaware is popular. There is one instance um, where I would think forming a Delaware makes sense, and that is if you know your intent is to become a publicly traded company or to attract um, venture capital. In that situation, you're really restricted to a corporation, and they want to see a Delaware formation because um, the classification of shares can be done in such a way that's very favorable to the investor. Um, and so, if that's your goal, and it's in realistic, not something you just came up with, it's something you have a business plan, you have an idea, it's, you know, you've really laid it out. Mm -hmm. The Delaware is somewhere that you want to uh, incorporate for that purpose. Um, because I think that it's, it's you know, it, if you form in California, you can probably still get funding, but there's going to be less interest. Um, if you're an LLC, uh, there's going to be no interest. Um, well, not no, but uh, very little interest. You know, they want to see that Delaware Corp, they're comfortable with it. And when I say them, I'm talking about venture capitalists. They're comfortable with it, um, you know, and, and so that's really your only choice. Uh, of course, you really don't care because if you get venture capital, you know, you have money, you can develop the business and so on. Right. right. Um, the second thing about states is, although Elena and I are both in California, um, the states have really taken a revolutionary view as to where you incorporate. And what caused it was uh, the sales tax on the Internet. Um there's been an effort to come up with a national sales tax since about, I don't know, 2000, and it's failed miserably because, you know, you just have to look at Washington, D.C., see how many conflicts we have in our politics. Um, the states can't get their act together. They can't agree on one form of sales tax. They can't even agree on the form. Um, and so it's never really happened. But what has occurred is that it's, it's triggered um, the, the attention, if you will, of the tax agencies in the states. And so before... Yeah, you know, in, in 1980, people would form Nevada LLCs or Nevada, well, not LLCs, Nevada corporations, um, all the time. And let's say people in California would do that, and they would run their business through Nevada corporations. And the tax agency in California, the Franchise Tax Board, wasn't all that aggressive about going after them. But with the internet and the changes in tax revenues that are earned from purchases, I mean, just consider I myself am a slave to Amazon. I buy practically everything on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, California doesn't, well, now it does get some sales tax from that, but until recently, California lost all of that sales tax revenue because I don't go down to the local store, I don't go down to Home Depot or whatever to buy those purchases. 
So the tax agencies now are much more awake to the idea of this, you know, national business and people putting businesses in, in states that have favorable taxes, and they will now aggressively hunt those areas. Um, California has, you know, the Franchise Tax Board is known to have investigators. All they do is go down the uh, the corporate, um, you know, the corporate roles and try to figure out, you know, if these are really California businesses and challenge them. Other states do it as well, New York, Illinois, uh, and you're seeing this this kind of development. So. If you are going to form, um, you know, an entity in a tax favorable area such as Nevada, I agree completely with Elena. You definitely want to talk to your CPA and you want to talk to your attorney to make sure it makes sense, because in most situations you're going to have to uh, qualify in your own state, which means you're just paying more fees for no particular reason. Um, and you know, some of the taxes that Nevada and Delaware and these people tell you is they'll tell you your information is confidential, and that uh, you'll never know. You know, nobody'll ever be able to discover who's a shareholder. I can go pay a private investigator 500 bucks and I can find the shareholder of every Nevada corporation in a day. <laughs> you know, most of that stuff is marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, so unless there's a really viable reason to look at these other areas, you know, I'd be very careful about incurring the expense. Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Elena, let's move on to you. I have a question now that we're talking about setting up a business. Let's talk about trademarks. And so we set up a business. We have a name. You know, when should we even start thinking about that or should we already start thinking about that right away, you know, in terms of trademarking our business name and then even down the road when we create products of our own, should we be trademarking those as well? Can you speak to that, please? In the ideal world, it would be nice to have your trademark application filed before you make the public aware of it, but that's not always uh, realistic. Um, I know that with uh, Internet businesses, it's important, it's really important to get um, your domain name, if you're using it as a trademark, uh, registered as a trademark early on, because that's the, that's probably, you know, the main source of your value. I mean, obviously, if someone's going to use um, a similar name, they could divert traffic away from yours and so forth. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, there are ways to save the trademark. Trademarks can be expensive. Um, I mean, just the filing fees with the United States Patent and Trademark Office are 225 But you can imagine that when you have several, and a lot of businesses do, that that can add up. And when you're starting a business, that can be um, a bit of a cash crunch for people. So totally. there are ways to minimize how much you're spending up front but still getting some protection. Um, for example... Say you have a trademark, uh, a word mark, and a logo, and a slogan, or actually just go with the the word mark and the the, lo- the logo. So what you could do is save the logo for later if that's not the most important part of your trademark, which it probably wouldn't be if it's an internet-based business. Um, and then you know use just just the words, register just the words for now, and then later as um, you know cash flow is better, you can add on you know, other features that you want to protect. Now, I know most people don't actually even do the trademark, and I've heard a lot of people rely on this thing called the fair use or first use, and it's, I believe, you know, if you're the first one to actually come up with that name and use it, then you have some legal stance on it and ownership. Is, it, is that even true? Obviously, trademarking would be the best thing, but is is there a first use kind of thing that exists? Well, th- there is some truth to that. Um if there are, okay, from the person who's registered a trademark, from from this person's perspective, we don't like that because <laughs> um, right. you can go and register your trademark, but then you find out somebody else has started using it before you. Um, they, you don't get to stop them from using it, even even if it's for a you know similar class of goods and services. Um, but you can stop them from expanding their usage. So. You know, from the from the person who's trying to economize and doesn't want to register a trademark, uh, that's what you have to keep in mind: is that you you get your first use, um, and then someone who comes later with a registered trademark can't necessarily stop you, but you can't really grow your business or expand it, you know, to other products or other services or other, you know, states mm-hmm. or you know. Um, once someone else has a registered trademark. So really what you want to do is go ahead and, you know, get that registered trademark and then you know going forward you're protected. I see. How long does it take for a trademark to usually get finished after you start the process? 
Once you file, it can take 9 to 12 months, but I actually have been seeing them come through a lot quicker lately. I had one that just came through after only five months. So that was really impressive. The trademark office is actually probably one of the best functioning government offices that we have in this country because they're, um, you know, they're just always improving their procedures and they're getting faster and and the prices have even come down. <laughs> yeah, well, so. that's that's good. I mean, that that's that's great. Uh, but I mean, five months, six months, a year is is a lot of time. So, would you recommend for people who have like a business idea right now? I mean it's better to get started right away, right? To go out there, put content into the world, to build authority, build your brand, get that domain name and all that sort of stuff. You're not saying to delay six months to get the trademark first. No, 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 not at all. Um, So when I say, you know, to take action right away, what I'm really saying is you file your application. So the first one to file has priority. Okay. um, Even if it hasn't yet registered. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So you're, you know, you're on the road to getting protection by the time you file the application, which can be done, you know, that day. Mm -hmm. Um, It does take about five, like I said, a minimum of five months um, at this time for the mark to actually register and for you to get a certificate of registration. But you're good, uh, good to go for initially, at least uh, once you file. Great. Okay, that's good to know. And then for products that we create, should we be trademarking them or like how do we protect the name of our you know online course for example and book even can you even do that with a book books you would generally want to get a copyright on them um but if you have say like like someone i think richard mentioned the dummy series earlier um or that maybe before we had before we got yeah, a call but pre-recording um anyway so the dummy series they have a trademark because it's a whole series of books all under the name the dummy okay. dummies you know whatever book for algebra or something mm-hmm. but um so that's a trademark and it's also a copyright so the copyright protects the content and then the trademark protects the brand name got it okay um and then your products and all those kinds of things i mean is it generally i guess it's a rule if you really wanted it to be protected you go ahead and trademark or copyright it right um, yes, and then you don't want to go overboard because there are expenses associated with um, trademark maintenance. So after five or six, between the fifth and sixth year after you register a trademark, you have to do um, a new another statement showing that you're continuing to use the mark. And then um, at the 10-year point, you have to file another statement. And then after that, it's every 10 years. But that can be burdensome. I've seen that happen with clients where they would get, you know, five or 10 trademarks and then, you know, they get to the five to six year point, maybe things aren't looking so good business wise and they say, well, maybe we don't need all these trademarks and they start, you know, whittling them down. So, um, you do have to be careful, but yes, you can register a trademark on say like a menu item or, um, you know, any specific service that you might have, a product that you might have. Um, generally the business name, um, isn't, isn't necessarily a trademark, but usually it turns out to be. So, um, you know, uh, domain names, again, they're not necessarily a trademark, but they can be if you're using it as a trademark. Mm -hmm. And um, I can explain that further to anyone who's interested in talking about that. But it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an art on defining when it's being used as a trademark. Not everybody understands that. Yeah. Right off. But. Well, we could save that for a further conversation, uh, Elena. And yeah. Thank you for that. Now, Richard, let's talk a little bit about using content that other people have used. I know it's okay to, for example, use certain images or quotes or certain blocks of text that other people have shared or even music on your own site. What protection should we have or how do we know that we're doing this in the right way that's not going to, you know, has somebody coming after us? Uh, well, Typically, you're talking about copyright. Copyright's probably the most common uh, legal dispute that you see online. Mm-hmm. Um, copyright generally is simply the uh, the right to um, copy, perform uh, something that you create. Um, and when you talk about it in a vacuum, it, it can be difficult to understand. But I think if you talk about it when using an example, you know, it can be helpful. So, um, you know, let's consider uh, you know Stephen King book. Um, you know, it's 300 pages of text. Um, there, it, that text is copyrighted automatically when he creates it. 
um, you know, for the purpose of this discussion. So when you're looking at content online, be it pictures, songs, text, or whatever, you should assume that it is copyrighted and that you can only use it then if you have the permission of the person who owns that copyright, typically the person who created it. So in the, the instance of a Stephen King book, he's created it, he owns the copyright, he signs an agreement with the publisher, that publisher is then given the right to uh, copy and distribute and sell, obviously, that book in exchange for royalties paid to King. Mm. So that's the basic concept of copyright. Now, there are situations where um, you can use it without consent or where consent is given to you either automatically or semi-automatically. Um, when you're looking for images and songs and things of that sort online, one of the best places to look is um, uh, Creative Commons. Creative Commons has a licensing system set up. Um, the web is, is a unique business environment because in the brick-and-mortar business, most businesses would not share their intellectual property. Uh, freely, they would charge for it. On the web, people share things right and left, uh, open source software being a perfect example. Um, so in the Creative Commons situation, you can go in there and you can find content, maybe it's images, maybe it's songs, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, that already have licenses attached. As long as you read and comply with the license, you're fine. Now that compliance may involve, you know, listing who, you know, the person is that created it, uh, mm -hmm. and what have you. Uh, so that's probably the best free way to do it. Just going out and finding something that you like and copying it and republishing it is almost always going to be infringement uh, because you don't have permission because there's no consent there. So if you go to Google, you know, Google's the famous case, Google's search engine, they have an image search engine. If you just go in there and start copying things and republishing them, you know, you're infringing. Uh, if you're really lucky, you'll get something, you know, that Getty Images is in control of and they'll send you a nasty letter demanding $5,000 to settle the infringement case. Um, so you don't want to do that, and you don't want to copy off of Facebook or copy off of news sites or anything of that sort. You really want to just think it through. Um, you know, the best option and the safest option is either Creative Commons or to actually purchase um, the content. You know, I have a blog, I have a couple sites, I post images on them, I get them all from Fotolia, uh, which is F-O-T-O-L-I-A dot com. They're really cheap. Um, they have images. You know, there are a number of stock image sites out there that you can use. If you use those, you never have a concern. Um, and then there, there are practical legal defenses to it. Um, one would be public domain. If something is in the public domain, um, just because it's published on the Internet does not mean it's in the public domain. Public domain refers to something where the copyright has expired. Uh, and that's typically after 70 years after it's created or 70 years after the person that created it died. It depends on the exact measurement. But basically, if you're you know, trying to use anything that was created after the 1930s, public domain doesn't really count. Um, the other issue that you, you get into is fair use. Fair use is um, a difficult legal concept to explain because it's decided on a case-by-case -case basis. There isn't really – there are some general standards you can lean on, but there are four factors that a court will look at, um, and they'll weigh those factors differently. In 1985, there was a Supreme Court case that said basically, um, you know, we have these four factors, but really the biggest, most important thing is um, – is your use of that copyrighted content going to cost the original copyright owner money? So, for instance, if I took the Stephen King book and I made exact copies, I made my own fake cover and I started selling it on Amazon, I would be costing him money because people would buy the alternative book. Mm -hmm. In that case, fair use would not apply. Uh, and then the argument was that if you had a situation where you know you weren't using it uh, or you weren't going to cost that person money, then um, you know you were much more likely to be found to have fair use um, defense. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court's kind of changed that in the last 10 years, and now they look at the four different elements, which are um, basically you know, the purpose and character of the use. Are you using it commercially? Are you using it for you know, educational purposes or nonprofit? Um, are you using you know, the nature of the copyrighted work? Um, you know, a whole bunch of legal standards that people probably really are not really interested in. Uh, as a default, I would buy stuff. I wouldn't really rely on fair use unless it's an obvious situation, such as criticism, like a movie review, if you're using it for news. Um, something of that sort. You know, in those situations, you know, you're probably okay. As a default, you know, I just, I myself, I either grab it from Creative Commons or I just purchase it. It's pretty cheap to do these days. Um, you know, and that way you're never really worried about anything coming back to haunt you. If you do use a copyrighted image um, or content of some sort, uh, the good news is, again, we return to the DMCA. While you might get a cease and desist letter from an attorney, uh, the typical first thing that you're going to get is actually a DMCA takedown notice. 
and your host or somebody is going to contact you saying, we received this notice that you're infringing on somebody, and if you take that content down, you know, often you're fine. I wouldn't rely on that completely, but in the practical, real-world situation, that's typically what's going to happen. What about images that you take yourself of things that you might be reviewing? Maybe you're shooting a video of something that you're um, doing a review on that you're going to put on YouTube, or you have a blog post that has images of a particular product that you're showcasing, is that okay to do or do you still need permission from that product owner to use those images? My view is if it's a review, that it, then it's okay. Um, as long as you're using, you know, you're being brief about it. I mean, if you're taking a picture of, uh, you know, the product's cover, then you're probably okay. I wouldn't worry about that too much. If you're copying huge swaths of whatever it is, you know, it becomes much more, um, you know, much more questionable. Um, but if it's a review, if it's criticism or commentary on it, you know, where you're, you're, you're not doing it for the purpose of, you know, reselling it essentially or using it to make a profit, you know, you're probably going to be fine. So if you think of any news story, if a news story reports on, um, you know, some element of a corporate report or something of that sort, um, you know, they're fine. And if we've all seen the millions of movie reviews on YouTube, those are all fine right. uh, because they're commentary. You know, the question is, you know, really what's your motivation? Um, you know, it comes down to the fair use defense. And the problem, there are two problems with the fair use defense. The first is it's a defense which means it's really only resolved typically at a trial. So even if you win on the fair use defense, you spent 50 grand in legal fees or more defending the case. So have you really won? Mm, you know, perhaps. Uh, and then the second problem is <laughs> the more you read about for fair use and the more you see the decisions come down, the more courts are kind of all over the place. They literally look at it on a case-by-case um, basis and you know one legal commentator I read recently in a fair use case I was looking at even suggested the judge should just decide if it's fair use or not and then come up with a theory as to why he thinks that um, so it's 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 difficult you know for instance there are four factors well what if the judge finds two of the factors are violated and two of the factors you know are in your favor and you essentially have a tie so how do you decide the case um, so, you know, unless it's an obvious situation where it's commentary, the other, the other area, of, uh, obvious situation is parody. So, for instance, if you really want to read an abomination or you're having problems sleeping, go read the Apple iTunes Terms and Conditions. It's 56 pages. Um, and I'm currently creating a, uh, an article for one of my sites where I go through it and I do the plain English interpretation of, you know, the various clauses with hopefully a uh, humorous twist to them. That'll be a parody. Now, I can guarantee you Apple's attorneys will probably send me a cease and desist letter, and I'll send it back a thing saying, you know, it's parody, you know, go pound sand, and off we'll go. Um, but in that situation, it's making fun of it. So if you see college humor videos on YouTube and they, you know, they cite something that would otherwise be copyrighted, that, you know, it's a parody. Uh, right, any right. of the late night shows, you know, uh, Stephen Colbert doing the takeoff of the Hunger Games, it's a parody. Um, so in those situations, you're fine as well. There are other classifications, education exemptions, and things of that sort, but they're they're really rarely invoked, and I can't imagine most of your um, you know listeners would actually use those. Now, what if you are doing something like a review, but it's with an affiliate link? Um, can you talk a little bit about the affiliate relationships and kind of the things that we have to worry about? Well, the affiliate relationship, you know, you know in that sense, I mean, you need to disclose. Basically, is the biggest issue right now. Yeah. You know, and this is kind of a hot topic with the FTC. Um, the FCC is looking at, you know, they want to make sure that people, when they go to a site or they go to a video or whatever, and they, you know, see a review or they see something that's there, they know if there's any bias. And, uh, you know, PewDiePie, the gamer on YouTube, uh, you know, he recently ran into this, not so much him, but he and other uh, gamers that are popular on YouTube were being paid money by one of the gaming companies. And it wasn't really, it was disclosed, but it was disclosed far down in the description under the videos where, you know, people might or might not have seen it. And the FTC went after the gaming company and forced them to change those kinds of situations. So you're going to see a lot of that, um, that kind of approach. So, in fact, if you go to Smart Passive Income and you look at the resource page, if I remember correctly, there's a big paragraph explaining that, you know, these are affiliate links and what have you. Yeah. Um, in relation to, you know, the copyright issue, you know, the affiliate links, you know, it depends. If, if the review is of the product and it's generally positive, um, your affiliate agreement with that company typically is going to have a clause that allows you to use that content. So there's a license there that will allow you to do it. And if you're negative, it kind of depends on what the terms say. Um, you know, non-disparagement clauses can be included in the terms. And what a non-disparagement clause is, is basically you can't criticize us yeah. uh, or our products. And those generally are not found to be um, 
particularly binding, um, because otherwise people use them. Uh, there's, a, there's a case called Clear Gear, and Clear Gear um, is a website that sold various products, and their terms and conditions contained a non-disparagement clause, which said that you could not leave a negative Yelp review regarding the company, and if you did, you agreed to pay a penalty of $3,500. And the uh, a couple had a bad experience with the company, and actually, if you look at their Yelp reviews, a lot of people did. Um, and so they complained, and they published something actually on ripoffreport.com saying this is a ripoff. The company sent them a notice for the $3,500 penalty. They didn't pay it. The company reported it to the credit agency, damaging their credit rating. They sued in court. Uh, the judge found it was you know, an unconscionable clause in an adhesion contract and awarded uh, $300,000 to the couple against the company. Um, so <laughs> disparagement clauses aren't great, but... Um, uh, you're rarely going to see those anymore. But um, so typically, if you have an affiliate link, as long as you're, you know, being clear that it is an affiliate link and that you're being compensated, um, you know, typically you're going to be fine. Okay. Cool, uh, Elena. I have a question that comes from a reader or listener here. On a similarly related note, you know, when it comes to employees, and you know, a lot of people who are expanding their businesses, they're hiring people and sometimes those people are coming on as employees and sometimes they're coming on as uh, contractors. Which one is better? How do we know what actually makes sense for, for our business? Well, companies generally like to have independent contractors because they don't have to pay employment taxes and provide benefits and, you know, um, but there's a balancing test to determine if it really is an independent contractor or an employee. And basically, it's an employee if you control what will be done and how it will be done. And it's an independent contractor if you control only the result of the work, not what will be done and how it will be done. So it's kind of a little bit of a control test. And, um, you know, uh, some clues are does, does the person – the independent contractor or employee have other customers or clients too, or do they only work for your company? Um, do they use their own supplies and materials and tools to perform the work? Uh, do they work when they want to, or do they have to work during certain hours? Do they have to work at your business location, or can they work wherever they want? Does the person have their own business license? Um, does the person have it's their own corporation or LLC through which they're working? Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, you know, it's really a, kind of a control test and you, you should talk to an accountant, um, to go over the details with that and just be careful because if you have your, if you classify them as an independent contractor and you don't, um, withhold payroll taxes and then they're later deemed to be an employee, then you will have a big problem. Awesome. Thanks, Lena. Uh, mm-hmm. Richard, when we are, this is a big question I get, when we interview somebody for a podcast, do we need a release form from them in order to use their audio files for our podcast? Yes. <laughs> now, does that form need to be a handwritten you know, PDF or whatever that's sent back, or can that just simply be an agreement over an email? Ooh, um attorney, I would definitely prefer it be an actual written agreement. So better safe than sorry, you're saying for that? Yeah, the concern is really this. Um, you know, you need to lay down the specifics regarding the usage of the files. So, for instance, let's say that, um, you know, you do podcasts over a number of years and you identify 10, you know, really great podcasts that went well uh, and you want to create a, you know, collective, uh, it sounds strange, but a CD or something of that sort to sell it on Amazon. Sure. Well, when that person agreed to be on the podcast, did they agree to also, um, you know, let you use their information on that CD? Uh, what about payment? What about, you know, copyright issues or right of publicity? Right of publicity is uh, an antiquated idea, but it's, it's gaining new life and law. What right of publicity basically says is that you have the right to control your image, your name, things of that sort. Um, it's, it's kind of being hacked out on social media right now where you have people's images being used when they don't consent. Right. Uh, couples breaking up, things of that sort. It gets nasty. The law is not really settled in that area, but it is becoming a bigger issue. Um, so generally, yeah, you, you, you do want that, and that's the best way to go. As far as email, um, you know, it's better than nothing. And in some cases, it's fine. 
Um, but the problem is the email message typically, well, the email message would typically be used in court to show, you know, a party admission by the other side that they allowed, you know, this to happen. The question is whether that goes far enough. So again, if you were to, com- you know, to compile those, take blog posts, let's say you do a bunch of interviews. I know you do interviews with different people and you were posting on Smart Passive Income for a while. I don't know if you still do it, but when you were doing those, um, you know, and you wanted to create a compilation, an ebook, uh, with all these different interviews, mm-hmm. you know, it's unlikely in an email exchange that you would have addressed that issue. Uh, now you could come back later and, and, you know, address that with the guests. Right. And right. most of the guests would probably agree. Right. Um, but a far better way to do it so you can keep everything organized is just to have a template form that covers these issues. You know, it, when in the, when the podcast or the blog post or the interviews or whatever it is, is first addressed. Then you have a record of all that stuff, you know, and you're in good shape. Even then, sometimes, you know, I tell clients, well, go back and make sure that the person understands. Because if you interviewed them five years ago, and then suddenly there's a book out and, you know, they're interview number one in the book, you know, they may not recall. Mm-hmm. And so they get, you know, unhappy and what have you. But, yeah, generally releases are a definite. Okay. Do you know of a good place where one could get a release like that, or are there any templates available? Well, let me tell you about the law. This is Richard Chapo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any lawyer should be able to put one together for you in you know half hour. Um, you know, some of them will already have them. I do. Um, I haven't really thought about what I would charge for them. Uh, I just use them with my current clients, but um, I would definitely have somebody actually draft it for you. This wouldn't be a legal Zoom or that kind of a, a, a thing. Okay. They're not going to have. You know, they're not going to cover the various issues, but it should be a minimum cost, maybe a hundred bucks. Okay. And then here is a question that is actually a really good question. So let's say you are uh, a person who's talking about health and fitness, or maybe somebody who's creating recipes for people who are in paleo or CrossFit or whatever. Can a disclaimer, just a written disclaimer that says, hey, I'm not a health professional. These suggestions are based on my own opinions, research, and personal experiences. They are not designed to diagnose, treat, or cure any health conditions. Please consult your doctor before drastically changing your diet, like that sort of stuff. Does that have any leak? Like, can that hold up in court? Is that, does that form any sort of protection for you or no? It helps. Um, it's It's... The internet is a little bit different than the warning you see on your mattress when you buy a new mattress. Um, the problem with the, the web is that they want to see acceptance. Um, you know, when the internet law first developed, you know, most of the judges were 60 or 70 years old and couldn't set up their own email. Um, they weren't familiar with, you know, the workings uh, of the law uh, or of the web. And now they are. And so the problem is, is that unless you could show some kind of an affirmative acceptance by the people um, who are viewing that disclaimer, it's not going to be an absolute defense. Um, so if you go to certain websites and you want to purchase something or you want to you, know, you want to rent something, you want to become a member, they, they force you to check a box that says, I agree to the terms and conditions and the privacy policy. Um, what you also see now is people saying, adding disclaimer to that and the disclaimer of the site. At that point, that's an affirmative evidence that somebody has accepted the disclaimer. They've recognized it, you know, and they're essentially agreeing to it. And in that situation, it's it's really going to help you. And it can be an absolute defense depending on the judge's attitude. It also depends on the nature of the disclaimer. Um, if you're, if you're doing a weight loss product, um, or a weight loss site and, you know, you put up an image of a woman who weighs 300 pounds and then the next image is, you know, she's super thin, looks like a supermodel and you say she lost 72 pounds in one week. No disclaimer is going to save you. Um, you know, it's just a lie. Right, right. <laughs> and, and the FTC is going to come after you for what they call uh, deceptive marketing practices. Um, and in court, you're going to get fraud claims and things of that sort. And, you know, the disclaimer isn't worth you know, anything. Um, you know, in, in most cases, I would say absolutely include the disclaimer. It doesn't hurt. Um, and, and it's something that you can leverage in court. And if nothing else, you can put it up, uh, you know, on an exhibit board in front of the jury and say, you know, we have this, this disclaimer and, you know, it should be enforced and what have you. The problem is the FTC is really hot and bothered in this area, and they've started issuing what are called dot-com disclosure documents. I believe I sent you one. You probably fell asleep after the second page. They want disclaimers to actually be placed directly next to whatever um, product or service um, the, the, the disclaimer applies to. So if you were selling a bottle, let's say you're an affiliate and you're selling a bottle of weight loss pills, they wouldn't want the disclaimer placed right next to it before they'll consider it binding. And courts are going to look at that, and that's going to be very persuasive to a lot of judges because most people are going to have the disclaimer done in a, a link uh, in the footer of the site or in the terms and conditions. 
in those situations, the chance of the disclaimer, you know, getting you out of trouble, it's not going to be great. Um, so it's kind of an evolving area of law. The problem with the FTC is the FTC has never run a business. Those people have never run a business. And so they, they require things that are just absurd. Uh, and you and I have had this discussion. Mm-hmm. Social media, um, you know, if you have Kim Kardashian or Selena Gomez, I think she gets paid $500,000 per Instagram post, sponsored post. Yeah. Um, you know, if she does a tweet or something of that sort and she's being paid for it, the FTC wants her to put a disclaimer in the tweet. Well, the tweet's only 140 characters long. So, you know, how are you going to do that? And they come up with these, you know, bureaucratic rules about, well, you can link to a page that would have the disclaimer, which nobody is going to do, and nobody does. Um, <laughs> so so the disclaimer area is a bit a bit confused right now. Should you have a disclaimer? Should you use them? Yes. The disclaimer has to be reasonable. If you have a check of the box, which is called a click wrap agreement, if you have a check the box function on your site, um, you know, add the disclaimer to that. So it would read, I agree to the terms and conditions, the privacy policy, and the disclaimer. And keep a log of that. That's going to be much more effective uh, in a, you know trying to enforce the disclaimer. So, Richard and Lena, thank you again for your time. There's obviously a lot more we could talk about, but I think for a lot of people who uh, lasted to the end here, at least, um, you know, they're going to be you know happy that they got a lot of this information. But I think a lot of people will also be quite overwhelmed, and especially for those who are just starting out. I mean, it's it's a lot to think about. And the last thing I want to do is scare people away from starting a business that could you know, change their lives and change the lives of many others. Can each of you say, you know, one thing to to help these people through, you know, a lot of these legal things and, you know, when they're just starting out and even for people who have already started, you know, how how do we just make sense of all this in the best way possible? Obviously, one of the best things you could do is find an attorney that you trust and work with them through all these different things because each business is different, obviously. But any words of wisdom uh, before we finish off today? Uh, Richard, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, you know, the legal issues can be a little overwhelming. I think that a lot of these things are um, issues that if you're pushing the envelope. I think that if, if if you do things, even if you just sit down with an attorney and consult with them for an hour, uh, kind of on an outline, have a, a website review, um, you know, it's part of this. You know, I told you I would do free website reviews for anybody that's, li- you know, that's listening. If they have questions, um, you know, just contact me, SoCalInternetLawyer.com, and, uh, you know, I'll take a look at your site and let you know if there are any issues for free, no cost. Um, and just as long as you can isolate the potential problem areas of your site and take care of those, you know, you're fine. I mean, we're talking about copyright and a lot of these issues are somewhat esoteric. Um, once you get up and rolling, they're really not issues that you deal with too much. Uh, the key is just to have a good foundation in place, make sure that, you know, for instance, if you allow people to post to your site or something, you're going to be deemed, say, compliant and those kinds of things. It sounds like it's a, a big hurdle, but it's actually very simple. And once you learn the three-step process, you know, you never really have to worry about it again. So none of this should be considered something that's going to be a hurdle for you getting into business. Um, most of these things will actually help you. Uh, your terms and conditions, your privacy policy, disclaimers, although they're annoying and they, there can be legal minutia involved in them, they're there to help you uh, and they will protect you. Um, you know, with most of my clients, knock on wood, you know, by putting everything together properly uh, and organizing things properly, we have almost no legal issues that come up. Um, and, you know, if you do that and the listeners take the step, uh, you have to set it up right, they're ahead of 95% of the Internet. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the potential risk is, is almost nothing. It's just, you know, you have to do the annoying little things uh, and, you know, then you can get on and you know, start working on growing your business. Yeah. Well, thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. And you had, uh, again, one more I want to reiterate your offer there, which was uh, just a free quick consult. Um, if you email Richard, you could find his email over at SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Is that correct, Richard? Yeah, just drop me a note, and I'll be happy to either look at your site or you know answer any questions you have. Cool. Thank you. And Elena, uh, any final words of wisdom from you? Yeah. Um, I mean, having your own business is rewarding, and I think um, as long as you go in prepared and you manage your own expectations and you're ready to work hard, um, and then you're willing to take the steps to prevent a lot of the problems that can arise, then it, you know, you'll be you'll be fine. Um, a lot of the pe- problems people have is when they come in maybe underfunded. Um, you know, you've got to plan for it. not only the purchase or price of a business or, or, or the starting of a business, um, the operating expenses, but also un- unanticipated expenses, which always seem to arise. You can minimize that um, by, you know, doing due diligence ahead of time and, you know, just being, being careful, taking appropriate steps. But um, so having, you know, 
being prepared with adequate funding is important. Managing your expectations. Don't think that you're going to make a profit that first year. Some businesses don't make profit for several years. If you're prepared to live with that, um, then you won't be disappointed when you're not making a profit right away. And then also be ready to work hard. You have to make sure your heart's in it for the long haul. Sometimes you'll come upon challenges and then you might feel like giving up because it's just too hard. But if you push through, you'll get the rewards. Love it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Richard. Pat, there was one other thing I was going to mention. Um, I know that a lot of people have common questions about funding insurance. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's talk about that really quick. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, the insurance industry is about 20 years behind the uh, normal business, so it can be difficult uh, to find some insurance companies that will uh, insure your business. You should have insurance if you can afford it. Um, the reason why is the insurance will actually pay any settlement or any judgment against your business. But equally importantly, your insurance will pay your attorney fees to defend the lawsuit. Uh, if you just form a corporation or an LLC and you get sued, the problem is you know you're going to need 20 grand, 30 grand, whatever it is, to pay your defense counsel to defend the case. Most companies aren't going to have that. So insurance is really important. Finding it can be difficult. Um, there are two companies that I know that at least act as brokers for it. I don't know anything about these companies, if they're good or not, or anything of that sort. So you need to take a look at them yourself. One is the unfortunately named Hiscox.com. Uh, it's H-I-S-C-O-X.com. Uh, the second one is techinsurance.com. And then, Pat, I don't know if you want to mention the company uh, that you're with. Um, but, you know, getting insurance is definitely something that a business, you know, you want to do as a small business as soon as you can afford it. Again, there are a lot of different costs that you have when you start a business, but insurance is definitely one worth paying. Yeah, and, you know, knock on wood, I haven't uh, had the need for insurance for that particular reason. But, I mean, I still have insurance. I think it's important. I'll put in the show notes uh, who I use and, and links and all that stuff uh, of everything we mentioned today. But um, the insurance was actually really important for a DDoS attack that I had in 2013. I was able to recoup some costs from uh, a week and a few days of downtime as a result of a, of a hacker attack on SPI. Um, so it was helpful for that reason, too. Um, so, yeah, th- thank you, guys. Elena, did you want to give a, a shout out to where people can find out more about uh, you, like where, where what website um, and if you had anything uh, to offer? Sure. Um, my website is heroninlaw.com. That's H-E-R-R-A-N-E-N-L-A-W.com. And um, if you have any you know, business law questions or trademark copyright questions, feel free to send me an email or give me a call. I'd be happy to talk to you and see if I can help. Awesome. You guys are great. Thank you so much for what you do for me and what you've just done for the SPA community. And thanks. Um, you will, we'll talk soon, I'm sure. Um, cheers, guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thank Pat. All right. Thank you for listening in. I appreciate you listening all the way through. And I hope that wasn't too much for you. And you can always obviously download the transcript or re-listen to this if you'd like. You can also visit Richard at SoCalInternetLawyer.com. And Elena is available at HeroninLaw.com. As she mentioned, that's H-E-R-R-A-N-E-N Law.com. And uh, very generous offers they have to help you out with any questions that you might have. So uh, feel free to reach out to them, and uh, they're going to do their best to help you. Now, of course, you might be in a different state, so there might be different laws. You might be in a different country, so, of course, these U.S. laws do not apply. But I wish you all the best, and I don't want these legal things to stop you from doing what it is that you want to do so that you can provide value to another person and be rewarded at the same time or provide value to a large number of other persons. I hope you've been enjoying the free podcast content here. I'm really excited because it's one of my favorite things to do and I know a lot of you have already taken action from the content that you've listened to on the podcast. And if that's you, congratulations. Just keep going, please. It's one of my favorite things to see. But I also know a lot of you and a lot of you have been telling me that you've been wanting more. You've been wanting additional information, some accountability, some hand-holding along the way. And so depending on what it is that you're looking for, what I would recommend is actually go to smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. You'll see the courses that I'm offering there that are paid courses, but they're there to help walk you through certain processes. Depending on what problem you have or what issue or what thing you're trying to solve, go there, check it out. You can see if there's a course available for you and where you're at in your business right now, whether you're just getting started and and you just want to make sure you have all the right things in place before you actually devote a lot of time and effort into something, there's a course for you there. For those of you looking to get started with a podcast, there's stuff for you there. And there's going to be more courses there in the future. And how do I come up with those ideas for the courses? 
They come directly from you. So thank you for all telling me how I can help you better. And if you have ideas for more courses that I can create for you, just hit me up on Twitter at Pat Flynn. Let me know or uh, use my contact page on smartpassiveincome.com. But again, check out and see what's available, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. That will be continually added to over time. So check it out. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much for listening in. I appreciate it, and I look forward to serving you in next week's episode. We got a we got a number of success stories coming up, and a lot of great content coming your way. So keep listening in. Subscribe if you haven't already. And again, one more time, the show notes for this episode are available at smartpassiveincome.com/session two three one. Appreciate you. Thanks so much. All the best. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I've got one for you. It's called Dirty Money, and it's like a hybrid between a true crime and a business podcast. So hosts Jonathan Small and Dan Bova tell the tales of legendary scammers, con artists, and barely legal lowlifes who stop at nothing to rake in millions. Recent episodes include a man who looted $100 million from his own company. Crazy. Give it a listen. Head on over to Dirty Money right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.